Okay, good evening, everyone. Really nice so, to see so many faces and people here again at the 16th Vienna Deep Learning Meetup. Thank you for coming. Uh, we are two of the three organizers of the meetup. Um, the uh, inventors or founders and creators of this meetup and the 16th edition already are me, Thomas Liedy, um, Jan Schlüter here from the OFI, the Austrian Institute of Artificial Intelligence, and Alexander Schindler from the AIT, Austrian Institute of Technology, and TU Wien, who is not here tonight. Uh, we have to excuse him, he fell sick again on short notice. Sorry for that. But um, we have, once again, a really exciting program for tonight. Um, two really nice talks, uh, two exciting ones. And uh, before that, I have to thank also, um, to say a big thank you to A1 Telekom, who are hosting us tonight for the second time. If you don't know, the Vienna Deep Learning Meetup is a wandering one. We always change location, move from one location to the other one. We are doing this monthly, uh, but we are for the second time here at R1, uh, which provides this capacity, because I think we went over the 300 registrations this time again, which is really, really great to see that um, this meetup is so interesting to so many people. So uh, maybe applause to all of you uh, for, for making it here um, tonight. <laughs> Um, but um, usually we don't do online streaming, uh, but maybe we can progress the, the slide once and then we go back to the program. Um, for We have, for the second time, um, a live stream. So welcome to everyone who is watching uh, at YouTube right now. Um, and we have a brand new YouTube channel, because the first one we used a different one. So. Uh, this is our channel. We have this very complicated uh, URL right now, so better you search it on, on YouTube, Vienna Deep Learning Meetup. Um, that the reason for that is because it's brand new. Uh, Google demands that you have uh, at least 100 subscribers to get a custom URL. Um, and yeah, we would be happy to achieve that uh, soon. So please go to our new YouTube channel and subscribe. Um, so we can change the URL to something nicer than this complicated one. Um, but yeah, thanks to all the people who found it already and are watching online right now. Um, before I get to the agenda, uh, we also use Twitter on an irregular basis. And if you use Twitter and want to tweet from this deep learning meetup, um, please use the four letters as an acronym of our meetup. So it would be VDLM. Hashtag VDLM uh, for the Vienna Deep Learning Meetup. We have to put that on a slide soon and establish that as the regular hashtag. So yeah, um, at this point I want to thank the two speakers and then um, let's briefly mention the agenda of tonight. So first speaker is Navid uh, Rekapsatz, um, who is currently and has spent the last years at the TU Wien, the Vienna University of Technology, is a successful researcher on um, text analysis, text retrieval, or word embedding, uh, also uh, deep learning, as it uh, appears that to be a very important topic also for this um, area and domain of text analysis and word embedding. He is about um, to move, to change to EPFL, the, um, I call um, Polytechnic uh, of Lausanne, right? And um, yeah, exciting opportunity. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about it. But his talk is going to be about uh, demystifying neural word embedding, applications in financial sentiment analysis, and gender bias detection. So uh, he has chosen to present us uh, what is it about, about word embedding, uh, how can it be used in text analysis, but we have the specific topics of not only sentiment analysis, but specifically sentiment analysis in, uh, in the financial domain. But then there is this other topic of uh, gender bias detection, which is a very nice bridge that uh, we still are in the planning of um, doing one evening on ethics and bias in deep learning, but we had to postpone it. It's probably taking place in May. Uh, 
And um, for our second talk, we have Christoph Bonitz here from Atomic Software. Um, he is presenting us his review of Andrew and G's um, deep learning specialization course on Coursera, which is uh, giving very interesting insights on how it is to do that course, how it is perceived, how is the content, and how can you benefit the most of taking such course. Um, and then, uh, as a fixed program point in or agenda point in all of our meetups, um, the organizers, that's going to be me and Jan uh, this time, uh, sorry, excuse uh, Alex this time again, we are uh, presenting some uh, latest news and hot topics that we found and gathered since last meetup, uh, which is already more than one and a half months ago. Um, and then we have time for networking discussions. Um, R1 is, is providing us with drinks and snacks, and they are also organized the, this uh, live stream, which we're really thankful for. Um, yeah, um, thanks to R1 again. And then, yeah, let's start with our first speaker, Navid Rekapsatz. I try to cover different aspects of board embedding because I think that we have a different audience with different interests and also backgrounds. So I will talk about the algorithms as well as the applications and the intuition and also the definition of board embedding. Maybe it's uh, a new word for you. I will, I will explain that to you completely. Before then, I want to ask, I want to just get a, get a clue, get an idea of the, of the audience. So, uh, who is directly or indirectly working in uh, text processing, natural language processing? Uh, okay. Um, who is more interested in um, algorithms in uh, deep learning neural network? Right. And who is more interested in applications, especially in business area? Okay. Who is not interested at all? <laughs> okay. That's good then. Yeah. Just five people not interested. Kidding, nobody. Um, good, let's just start that. So, um, word embedding is actually a very important part of natural language processing. So, natural language processing tries to let us understand, let computer understand, and an AI system how the language of human, this very complicated system, works. And word embedding is an essential part of uh, these systems and whole of the deep learning applications that wants to process natural language. The concept of word embedding is connected to the concept of semantics, something that's not new at all. And uh, for years and years, philosophers and linguistics were more concerned with that. And, lingu and semantics is actually some things over the language, some things about the concepts that we have in our mind. For example, when we see this picture, we know that the door is closed. Maybe I said that in English, or maybe I said that in different languages. But it's a concept and it's semantic in our, in our mind um, that conveys the, the concept of a door that is closed. And also, there are words um, that we, we conceptually understand them. For, for example, good and bad, we kind of understand what's the relation between them. They are antonyms. And bad and ugly, the same. And when we put all of this three together, we create a new semantic which is related to a movie and so. So, so you can see the different layers of semantics that we have in our mind. And an AI system tries to 
uh, in a way understand that or represent that in, the, in a computational point of view. And this representation in a computational point of view of semantics is related to the concept of word embedding. So words, as the smallest part of the language, the smallest meaningful part of the language, we want to present that, represent that by a vector representation. And this vector representation uh, is in dimension D, uh, and each of these values are kind of related to a concept in the language. So that's a way that uh, we represent the semantics through words and we call uh, through uh, vectors, and we call that vectors, semantic vectors, or simply word embedding. In fact, we embed the semantics of the word into a vector with d dimensions. And this d dimension is usually uh, 300, 400, and so on and so forth. The people that work on deep learning are also definitely um, very familiar with representation learning, so this vector is actually a representation of the concept of a uh, word. And the way that this works is that we have a corpus in hand, we have a word embedding black box, and this word embedding method uh, black box creates for every word uh, a vector of d dimensions. And for all of the words that, in, uh, that are in the language, uh, we have a vector representation. As said, this vector representation is actually supposed to uh, grasp the semantics of these words. And when we have these vector representations, and they are in 300 dimension, but for visualization we can uh, put them into two dimensions, and when we have, we, we just uh, project them into two dimension, we see a space like this. That's a space of embedding for the language or for the words. And we zoom in, we see that kind of the, the, the groups, the clusters that are closer to each other represent words that are semantically in some way uh, more related to each other. For example, the terms that are here are the countries, or the terms that are here are the months. Uh, and so on and so forth. And as said, this word embedding becomes recently very, very popular and very, very important. So that's a very good time to talk about word embedding, especially in, the in all of the applications that's connected to uh, deep, uh, deep learning. You can trace word embedding inside of uh, the system because it's all about the representation learning. And uh, one of the, uh, back into this slide, one of the uh, very famous uh, algorithms for creating these representations is word to vec that we will talk about it during this talk. Okay, um, before I start talking how we can create that uh, representation, I want to show you two of the applications that we work in at, uh, at Teovin, that both of them are based on the concept of word embedding. The first one, is about uh, observation, is an observation on the uh, bias in, uh, uh, through the different gender, the uh, female and male, in a Wikipedia text. So we took the text of uh, English Wikipedia and we uh, focused on uh, 350 occupations. And for each occupation, we calculated through the word embedding how much it's represented and is inclined through female factor and how much is represented through male factor. So the x axis here is the female factor and the y axis is the male factor and each of them are one uh, occupation. The red ones, the, the green ones, are the ones that are actually in the language a term that, is, that, has, a, that, that has a clear um, gender factor. For example, congresswoman should be really related to female factor and less to male factor. On the other side, there are terms that are, from the language point of view, they are neutral. For example, nurse and housekeeper. However, during the, the bias that's in this data, uh, the way that the language is written, we observe that the terms like nurse and housekeeper are perceived as jobs that's related to female, unfortunately. Uh, and also, they are very uh, strong in their bias. There are also some jobs that are very um, inclined to, 
to mail factor, however, they are not so strong. So uh, we see that, for example, housekeeper, as uh, if you use the uh, English Wikipedia, it's really related to, to female factor. So my point is that if you pick this word embedding and train it on Wikipedia that is ethically biased, and then use this word embedding in for an application, another application, you actually bring that intrinsic uh, bias of the data into your application, although that you really don't want to um, do anything that's ethically biased. So you kind of need to, before then, remove this bias that is intrinsic in the data. The next application that we work is uh, related to sentiment analysis in uh, financial data. So when we look at the stock of uh, the, the changes in the price of a stock in the, in the market, we see something like this. And when we look at these two areas here, uh, we see that this one is much more volatile. Volatility is something that we really don't want to have in financial market because we want a financial market that is stable. I mean, yeah. Um, and it's very important for us to predict what's going on, uh, what will happen in the, in the future of financial market. And the, this volatility is a measure that can tell us uh, how volatile, how, how, how it is changing uh, in, the, in the financial system. So what we want to do is that we want to take the text of the companies, the, the reports that companies write. Uh, that's one of them, really long, long reports that uh, annually they write. And from this text analysis, we try to understand whether we can predict the volatility of future of financial system. That was uh, the aim of this, uh, this work. And we use a sentiment analysis uh, using the award embedding based model. And what we observe is that, so here in this line, we see a typical uh, prediction model. Here on the x-axis, we have different quartiles. So we, are, we want to predict after one quartile, after two quartiles, and after eight quartiles, which is after two years. And here we have the performance of the prediction. So what we observe is that by, uh, by a typical uh, prediction model, you get a result like this. And when you use text, actually, the result is quite interesting, this uh, dashed. Uh, blue line, and when we combine the traditional model with this text processing model, you get the best results uh, over all of them. So that kind of shows us the importance of word embedding and how it can use for uh, even predicting the, the, the volatility of a financial market. The, in the rest of this talk, I will move from the applications of the word embedding into how it is created. As you see that many of people are more interested in the algorithmic point of view, and we want to open up this black box, look at it, and see how it works, um, but more from the intuition point of view, not very too much into the technical, uh, uh, technical details of that. So the idea of word embedding is actually not new as the idea of semantics is not new. So Firth in uh, 1975 so, uh, talks about the semantics and you says that you shall know a word or the meaning of a word, not by the word itself, but, but by the, the words that accompany this word. So the context of a word, the word that is with this word, are actually the words that define the meaning of and the semantics of that word. Later on, Wittgenstein uh, talks about, in most of the cases, the meaning of a word is in its use, meaning that uh, when we want to understand the semantic and meaning of a word, we should look at how it is used. So it's kind of related to data-oriented paradigms that's right now, especially with deep learning, is very hot. Um, and it's also interesting to talk about Wittgenstein as we are actually in Vienna and it was in the Vienna cycle, uh, Viennese cycle, circle. So, to give you a, an understanding of what does it mean of the um, accompanying words of a word, I'm going to show you one term, one word, and please let me know what's the meaning of that. 
what could it be? Now I'm going to give you some words that accompany these words, and you may tell me what might it be. It's a drink, yeah, right. What else? It's a brand, could be, yeah. It's, you know, say this is alcoholic drink, right? And now I'm going to show you another word that probably you know. And you see that the accompanying words of Heineken are kind of similar to the previous one. Could it be the case that Tesquino is semantically similar to Heineken because they have very similar accompanying words? That's the main intuition of the word embedding or the semantic algorithms. So we kind of say that Tesquino, which is a Mexican beer, by the way, a very old one, is kind of semantically similar to Heineken because when we look at the accompanying words of the word, the words that are in the context of both of them, they are similar with each other. So the intuition of our algorithms is that two words are semantically related when they have similar context words. Does it make sense? Good. So I drank the first one. I go for the second. So the rest we're gonna talk about word to back. Um, the the Mikolov uh, was, I think, in a deep learning meetup some time ago. So it's interesting to uh, try to get an understanding of how this quite complicated algorithm works and if we can really make it in a simple way and understandable way. So all of these word embedding models start from creating their training samples. Given the corpus that we have, that is the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog and it goes on and goes on and goes on, it's a corpus that we want to learn our embedding based on that. We create a window size of two that defines our context words. And we start to move from the beginning. So we have a central word and we have a, a context word here for the, we have quick and brown. And for example, here for fox, we have two words before then and two words after then. And for each of these co occurrences, we create one item of training data. So we have fox quick, fox brown, fox jump, and fox over. And here, the data here is actually what is our training uh, samples and the training data. It's, it's a very, the, it starts with a basic neural architecture that probably all of you uh, are very familiar with that. It has an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. The input layer is inside of the number of uh, words in the um, vocabulary, something like 200,000, half a million is quite a huge uh, vector. The one in the middle is D, which is 300, 500, so it's very much smaller. And the last one is output layer, is also the size of the vocabulary in the language. So you can see it's, it's kind of uh, encoder decoder. It's a big uh, vector, goes to small vector, and then again opens up to a, to a big vector. That will start with this architecture, and inside of that there is W and C. W is a matrix of the word vectors. That's actually what we use at the end. Uh, imagine that the space of the words. There is also another set of vectors called context vectors. Please remember these two uh, aspects that by training this model, what we create at the end is these two vectors, which are actually the byproducts of this um, neural architecture. And we use these word vectors and context vectors as our word embedding. Given the training data fox and quick, here comes the word fox into the input layer with the one hot representation. Here we have all of them zero. For fox, we have one. It goes through this uh, network. First, it does an encoding. It creates this embedding and this embedding, and then the, the values here. And at the end, we have some values uh, in the output layer. We have the decoding. And here, for all of the words, we have one value. 
the circuit, hen, quig, forest cable, and all of the other words that we have in the language. And what is important for us is that we want that to the probability of the quick here, as quick is in our training data, becomes higher and higher and higher, and the others becomes uh, less and less and less when the input is fox. So we train whole of our model in a way that we increase the probability of quick given the word fox. And by training, I mean doing back propagation, doing um, uh, stochastic gradient descent, and all of this stuff in neural models, uh, which actually change the values of the C matrix and W matrix. And just to remember again, W and C are our word representation, which is the byproduct of this architecture. Usually, when we talk about word embedding, we actually talk about this W, but there is also a C matrix uh, that's uh, behind uh, word embedding. We call that uh, context embedding. So to calculate this probability value, uh, what is in the basic neural architecture, we use the softmax. Probably you are familiar with that. And what softmax does is that normalize the output layer over all context vectors. So it has uh, this term, and it has sum of over all of the context vector and calculate this value. And to train this, uh, this, this architecture, this neural model, we need a, a cost function, and we want to minimize this cost function. And this cost function is just very simple. It's just a log of uh, this probability for all of the training sample that we have. I think the problem of this model is cl cl clear. The problem is calculation of the denominator of this probability. So we have a lot of training samples. If you look at Wikipedia, for example, the lens of Wikipedia, for each of the co-occurrence in the Wikipedia, we want to recalculate this huge factor. And it really takes time. So this architecture was introduced in 2003, but at the, at the time, it really didn't attract any attention because it was not really doable. You cannot, re it was not efficient, you cannot really uh, train that. It is still not, with, with the processing power that we have, it's still not a very efficient way of um, uh, training. So, you can imagine that the, the main part of the work to VEC and the very interesting part of work to VEC was actually solving this efficiency problem, but also it's a still very effective way of representation. To, uh, that might be a bit too technical, what I said. I'm just trying to make it in a simple way, mm, with a different point of view, more, more touchable. Imagine that that's our vector representation. Each of these circles are our words. And at the beginning, we start with all of these vectors randomly initialized, meaning that we just spread these words over our space. And you can imagine that it's very simple, uh, simplified. So we have a lot more words, and also it's two dimension, but in real time it's, it's 300, 400, 500, and so on. But it's just for grasping the, al uh, the algorithm. So at the beginning, we start with this vector space. And at the end, what we want to have is that words that are semantically similar to each other get closer and closer to each other and create uh, clusters. So that's what we want to have at the end of the day. And we want to talk about how from these guys here, we will reach to these guys here. If we continue with the example of Heineken and, Heineken and uh, Tesquino, at the beginning, they are just spread somewhere in the space. And at the end, we want them to get closer to each other in this space, OK? Coming back here, you can also remember that we had context vectors. Context vectors are actually in a different uh, space, but just for simplification, just for understanding that, we put both of these uh, spaces uh, together in the same uh, two-dimensional space. So this, we show this, but with circles, we show the word vector, the position of this, this word vector. And with these rectangles, we show you the context vectors. Is it good? If we have 
the drink here as a context vector, let's remove the other just for cleaning up the, uh, the slides. What we want to do is that since Heineken and drink appear together, co-occur together a lot of times, and since Tesquino and drink also appear, co-occur with each other many times, Tesquino tries to get closer and closer to drink, and Heineken clo uh, tries to get closer and closer to drink. And what happens at the end of the day is that Heineken gets closer to drink, Tesquino gets closer to drink, and Tesquino and Heineken ends up to be close to each other. So that's the basic intuition of this, this algorithm. Coming back again, so we, have, we are at the starting point, and we have the corpus of, in the corpus we have Heineken and drink. We want to know how we want to move from uh, through the drink, from the point that Heineken is. There is a really important question, a one million dollar question is that, I know that I should move somehow from the position of Heineken through the position of drink, but how long should I take this step? How long should be this arrow? And based on the, the basic neural network that we talked before then, you should calculate this value and normalize it over all of the context vectors. That's how long you should take these steps with this normalization. And as we talked before then, this denominator is too expensive to calculate. So that's the answer that our first basic neural network gives us. It's a good answer, but it's not efficient. The second answer comes from Wartwick and comes from a, a, a very interesting method called the negative sampling. Negative sampling says that, forget it. Don't normalize that, it's too heavy. I can't do that. Instead of that, calculate the probability with the sigmoid function. I showed you the sigmoid function if you uh, want to just remember that. So we use the sigmoid function to calculate the, uh, the, the amount of step that we want to take from Heineken to drink. However, we take another step. So we I call it the first part pool, because Heineken and drink kind of pool each other, just try to get closer to each other. But I have also a, a, st a process of pushing. So I randomly select k context vector and get away from these k context vectors. These k context vectors are something like 2 to 10 to 20 context vectors, so from one side, I get close from Heineken to drink, and from other side, from Heineken, I select 20 words, 10 words, 10 context words, and push them uh, ahead. I will show you in the, uh, in the slides. Why it is like this? The point is that if I have the word Heineken, the terms that are similar to Heineken, that are re relevant to Heineken, are just a few in language. However, language has a lot of words. So if I randomly select any word from language, with a really high probability, I can say that that is the similar term to language, uh, to, the, to Heineken. So I can take any word in the language and I say that I'm sure that this is similar. Uh, so imagine you are in, in, we are in Austria. Imagine the population of Austria. And we want to know the probability that somebody from toes to top is wearing completely red. I can say it's probably really low. If I randomly select one person right now in the population of Austria, it's really low. It's almost impossible that this person has this uh, condition of wearing a dress or a, a clothes that is completely red. <coughs> Unless it is in a uh, crew of Austrian airline, that's different. And that's the concept of negative sampling. You sample something that is negative. And since this probability is really low, you can say that whatever I sample is a negative sample. Coming back here, 
we had the Heineken, we had this question of, oh my God, how I can, uh, how I can calculate this, uh, how, how long should my, be my arrow, uh, how long should be my step. And uh, negative sampling, uh, Wartovex says that, forget it, use a sigmoid for the pool factor. But in addition to that, coming back to all of these uh, context uh, vectors that we had before then, randomly take, for example, two of them, these two of them, completely randomly selected. Be sure that they are dissimilar from Heineken, Heineken and calculate the push factor from Heineken to these two words. So we're going to get, we, we're going to make the Heineken closer to drink and we want to make it more dissimilar and away from these two other randomly selected terms. That's kind of all of that. And it's called negative sampling. The next step is that giving all of these push and pull things, we move uh, this term, which will end up somewhere like this. And by doing it again and again and again and again, terms that are related to each other, get closer to each other, and at the same time push the others away from, uh, from them. And they create clusters in the space that are semantically related to each other. Just for completion, it might be a bit uh, boring for some people, but um, that's the cost function of uh, Wartovec with negative sampling. And you don't need to know whatever happens here, the point is that it has two terms. The first term is actually this pool factor, which is genuine co-occurrence of, of the uh, co-occurrence of two terms. And the other is the push factors, which for k terms, uh, it calculates a value that has a minus. So it subtracts this value from the genuine co-occurrence probability, and it's randomly selected. Great. Um, that was the main part of the. Um, uh, I, I hope that I can. I could have kept to continue listening to me, and you're not sleeping yet. Uh, we have um, this open source library that, before I'm gonna promote that a bit, that we use for uh, search engines. It um, for Solar and Lucene. You might know about them. They are very famous. Uh, search engine applications, they are also open source, and we provide an open source uh, library that uses word embedding for document retrieval. And I'm going to finish the, the, my talk by a bit talking about the challenges and perspectives that are uh, in this area, of, at least from my point of view. One of them is that um, when we train this word to make, for example, on, a, on the health a corpus uh, on all of the documents that talks about the different aspects of health and disease and so on and so forth. What we see is that the, the disease like Alzheimer and MS becomes closer to each other. This might not be an interesting thing for different applications. For example, imagine that you are searching for Alzheimer and it thinks that MS is something that's related to Alzheimer. Therefore, it shows you also the documents that are about MS, which in search engine is called topic shifting. So your topic from Alzheimer, that's your interest, um, shifts to MS. So one of my interests is actually try to think of different approaches to train a representation that's task-specific or domain-specific. And in that way, I want to have Alzheimer separated from MS. The other interesting uh, work in that area is uh, representation learning of bigger language elements like a sentence, paragraph, and document, and so on and so forth. And what uh, uh, the other aspects, that's especially right now, is very important to talk about it more and more and more is uh, transparency, fairness in all of the machine learning algorithm and interpretability on them, especially when it comes to uh, deep learning applications. So. Thank you very much. For Thank you so much, Navid. Um, very excellent presentation. 
a lot of insights into the world of word embedding. Uh, I guess this was just a glimpse, so your knowledge is much deeper and you can answer more specific questions. Uh, let's have a few, let's have a little Q&A session right now. We have a question from there. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, you mentioned just now about multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's that they usually appear together when people try to, to see what happens. Is anyone trying to figure out why this happens? Could this mean something? The way, for instance, we use them in our everyday life, this could, be, this could mean that there is some correlation. Maybe this correlation doesn't have any physical meaning. Maybe it just means that people think these two things are the same. It may be just showing that people don't know enough about those two. But are, is there any work happening right now, people trying to find insights like this in language processing? Oh, yeah. If there, there, there is any work, yes. There are many. Um, you should imagine that it's not a handcrafted semantic representation. It's not like WordNet that people say that that's this meaning, that's this meaning, and so on. So you may not even know the language, but you create a representation. And it's completely statistical based. It's called statistical semantics. Um, and it finds out the patterns that's inside the language. So good and bad, from the patterns point of view, from an unsupervised algorithm, a company similar terms together, and at the end of the day, they end up in the same. So it's, it makes sense. It might not be useful in many applications. So therefore, you need also other, other ideas, other intuition to combine with that to uh, provide something that that's, that's works better for your target application. Can you maybe give a little bit of a hint on the surface of uh, how you would tackle the problem of separating Alzheimer's from multiple sclerosis if you want to do a domain-specific application for medicine where you don't want these together? Good, very good question. So what we do at Teubin and we continue also at EPFL is that um, one way is that you combine um, the res uh, handcrafted resource into your word embedding. You kind of combine them in a way together. Um, the problem with handcrafted uh, like WordNet and also in the health uh, domain, there are also a lot of uh, ontologies, is that they are really hard to, to be created. They're really expensive and they are incomplete. Um, Although with an incomplete resource, we can still kind of separate them from each other. Um, what is I'm more interested in is more statistical uh, approach. And uh, in a recent research, what uh, we are doing is, uh, if you look at MS and Alzheimer, for example, from the very short context that's around them, it's very similar to each other because they are from the short, some terms before them and some terms after them, they are very similar to each other. If you look at the whole of Wikipedia or a, or a, a domain-specific um, corpus, you see that MS actually happens in different documents than Alzheimer. So if you one time look at the small context, but another time look at the document context, uh, you can kind of separate them from each other. So we can have one word embedding that's created based on documents and another word embedding that's created based on small context. Mm -hmm. And then we can combine them together. In that sense, Alzheimer and MS start to getting more separated from each other. Um, yeah. So it's basically looking in that bigger scale that you also hinted at exactly, as an extension exactly. of the approach. Exactly. Yeah. OK, there was another question here and more there. <coughs> Right. Um, my question is regarding the words that have different contexts. The same, there are words in the language that are completely used in different ways. Right. With yeah. your algorithm where you push and pull, it would mean that it just goes forth and back, right? Right. So the question is, is there also exactly. some, some, some uh, condition where you would think you, you split those, those words because they just have, they are two 
different words? Exactly. Or is there something like that? Very, very important, very interesting question. Um, so th they have some word like Apple. It has just different senses. Uh, it might be the company, it might be uh, fruit. Um, uh, what happens at, at actually is not that the word Apple at the end of the day becomes, because it's not two dimension, it's 300 dimension, it's 500 dimension. And uh, the behavior in 300 dimension is very different from two dimension. I mean, we just simplified everything, but that's not the reality. Uh, and interestingly, Apple at the end ends up to be similar to orange and strawberry and also Microsoft. So it's not that it ends up to somewhere that is between them, it's actually similar to all of them together. But the point is that um, can we really understand uh, which of the terms are similar from that sense and which of the terms are similar from that sense? And it's a really interesting question. Um, I haven't seen a very concrete answer on that, uh, but uh, a recent research um, looks at the structure of um, different senses and kind of see that some senses become create a cluster, like the term uh, the, the senses that's related to orange and the strawberry. They also create a subcluster around Apple and Microsoft and Google and companies, tech companies create a subcluster. Um, there is, it's, I mean, it's also a statistical way, so it's not a 100% clean solution, indeed. But these subclusters would be in different dimensions, or does it happen that the orange ends up next to Microsoft also? That's uh, yeah, good, good, good. I mean, um, the, the concept of ends up to something in 300 dimension is very um, hard, to, hard to really talk about. It. But um, since this is a vector, and each of the dimensions actually talks about a concept, uh, we see that um, the concept of Orange and Microsoft becomes separate from each other. And the Apple, interestingly, has the concept of Microsoft as well as the concept of uh, Orange. That's good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So Orange and Microsoft <laughs> yeah, are it's separate. That, it's Depending uh, on uh, if other uh, tech companies <laughs> name themselves as the fruits. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that would be another thing. <laughs> Question here, yellow shirt, and then in the same row, and just behind. Hi, I have a jo uh, short question. So you talked uh, at the beginning of the presentation that we have the uh, the word vector and then the context word uh, vector and the size from the word vector, the context vector is reduced many right. times. But uh, how do you select the words in the context ve vector that was not, not presented? So how do you build the context vector that was not very clear in the presentation? Uh, so you, you mean that this uh, uh, neural network architecture that was input layer, hidden layer, output layer? Yes. So it has the context vector, uh, uh, embedding vectors and context vectors. Yeah. And they are, um, they are the parameters of a neural network um, architecture. But what is the algorithm to select? The so the, I think the, the, the hidden vector in the middle, it, the, it's not actual words. It's just these 300 dimensions that yeah. end up in a location in these but 300 what, what dimensions. What represent that and how, how do you build that? That is not. How to, how to, how, how, so that's when you have that, so we have the training data, and this training data starts with the input layer and output layer, and it does back propagation by a stochastic gradient descent, and it changes the, the values middle, of that's the That's the parameters. point, what happens in the middle? How, how do you build the middle and which are the criteria to, to build? So it's, it's just a simple hidden, uh, hidden layer which has a linear uh, activation function. That was a question. Oh. I think to put it a little bit in other words, it's like you have 300 uh, dimensions in the, so the input and the output are actual words, right? Right. And the middle layer is like 300 neurons, 300 uh, dimensions that are random in the beginning. And through the learning process, these 300 are updated so that uh, depending on the input and the output, uh, close words from the input and the output would be close 
to each other in these 300 dimensions. But these 300 dimensions don't have a meaning itself themselves. They, they don't represent the words themselves. They're just a mapping from the input to the 300 and then again to the output, which is words again. But they, yeah. they don't have a, you don't define them. You just tell the neural network you, the number, like you define, yeah, you want 300, exactly. but it's kind of arbitrary. Yeah, you could arbitrary. do 500 yeah. or yeah. 1000 or even bigger. I don't know yeah. what happens then. It's, it's interesting that uh, it's found that 300 is a good, it's appeared that like we're having you, you can 300 concepts. It's yeah, you can think of it a little bit as a compression. Like you have a, a large number of words, it's getting down. problem of deep learning you are doing something but you don't know what you are doing yeah. the machine is doing something for you right I mean it's, and it's this is the, that this is the uh, the big the criticism question. from the classical yeah. machine learning where you have categories which have a well meaning good meaning like you said before and even in example you you give the examples with well-known contexts or that had a meaning and uh, then th at the end you say actually this don't have a meaning well, um, it's a little bit different. Is, like this, this is this is the w the big weaknesses of of deep learning that you don't you cannot really explain what why do you have this but middle it, layer it, and it, what it, means that. To be fair, you should compare it more to a clustering algorithm. So even in a k-means clustering in traditional machine learning, you would define k and you can't answer really what the number k should be. And it's similar in this case. You want you define no, no, uh, three hundred as a number. It's as not a about the number. It's the meaning of Meaning of the every concept, in the vectors right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the not a, yeah, it's not a, it's not a clear thing because it's all yeah. in all of the representation. We don't know exactly each of these uh, concepts what it represents really from the language point of view. It's not understandable and interpretable, which is also a, uh, that's why my last point was actually, hey, interpretability is also very important here, which is missing indeed in the. Um, in, the, in this algorithm and many other deep learning algorithms. Sure, yeah. Okay. I have a question regarding evaluation. Uh, do you look only on the uh, cost function or do you have some automated evaluation metrics or you are looking on the words and how close they are together? For, for the, like, if one word embedding is better than the other? Yes, for example. Yeah, there are a couple of, like, I would say like 20 different uh, benchmarks that, like, to, to capture different aspects of that. Um, they're mostly annotated by human, that they say that these two terms, from my point of view, are more related to each other than the others, something like this. Uh, but evaluation is a big topic, so you can, when you, your application is in search engines, then you have different evaluation and you need different embeddings. So something that may work here may not be the other. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, a lot of questions. Hello? Yeah. Just a very short comment because there was the discussion going on about interpretability of deep learning and so on. So just a, not a question related to your talk, just more like in connection to what you said. So there's a whole range of um, people working on interpretable machine learning and deep learning in particular. And people are doing this and trying to understand what is happening in those networks for right, several yeah. years. And it's still an ongoing research, so it's not completely mystified what is happening. There's a, people are trying to figure out and trying to find the grounding for this. Yeah, it's, it's not like, mystery. I mean, I call it demystifying because it's not not really mystery. It shouldn't be mi mystery at all. I'm going to promote also continue your talk, uh, Fat Star um, a conference that is exactly about fairness and transparency in uh, machine learning. Yeah. Let's do maybe two more questions. Bias studies. What was the selection criteria for the professions? Because you might already have introduced some gender bias by choosing those 200 or 300 professions, right? How did I pick the professions? Yes, exactly. Um, I, I went to U.S. Uh, Ministry of Work and look at all of the jobs that there are and just picked all of them. So try to be as much as possible and biased about selecting them. That's, 
No, being not biased in such experiments is really it's tough. really yeah. Uh, selecting the US as a source might it's be It's exceedingly biased, biased, of course. No, I mean, ready. that's interesting to try that on German. It's going to be very different results. Yeah, I guess so. Um, do we have one more question? Everything answered? Yeah. Um, I have one question about... Um, the selection of uh, vocabulary, is there any way if you have um, something like word to vec and you want to apply it to words which are not in your vocabulary? So can you actually ah. do something with artificial words or something, you know, usually if you have a random um, uh, sequence of characters, it might be close to some word, for example, typos, I don't know, whatever. Is there something where you can actually use it, or are you really fixed to? Do you mean the words that you don't have in corpus? Yes, for if, if you have already trained yeah. um, your network, and, and then you want to apply it to words which you didn't know when training, but they might be close. So, uh, so, so for Think a word embedding, there are different words, algorithms. Word to, word to make itself is a sequential algorithm, so you can do continuous learning. So we can train it on Wikipedia today, and then in 10 days comes more arc uh, articles. You can just train the rest of the articles, and it's going to be fine. But then the question comes that, uh, what if I come up with a new term that um, I don't have it in my trained model? Um, that's an interesting question, uh, but I need, we need to know the context of this term because the term itself do not tell us anything until we know at least some terms that accompany with these words. That's, that's a very interesting question in, um, in cross-language word embedding, because you train two models with the parallel information from English and German, and then one of them gets more information, and then comes a term that is not uh, known in English, uh, in German, but you look at the, its English meaning and then come back again to the German representation. It's kind of, um, some people work on that. Yeah. Hope that I answer your question. Comment on that, so we had uh, the same location, I think it was in October, a uh, speaker from Setsnam, CSET, uh, the, the Czech search engine where they did the right. image net, the training on uh, images on with English terms, used the word embedding and then mapped another word embedding network on the, the Czech terms to the English terms, yeah. so you could realize a, a picture search engine in Czech language. Interesting, yeah. So the, I think the slides are still online, uh, in case you want to look it up. Um, yeah, I guess the rest of the questions we take to the break. Uh, Navid will stay wi with us. Um, we're going to have a little break um, in just a few minutes, but before that, uh, we do the announcement section. Um, normally, thank you very much. Oh yeah, uh, let's thank <laughs> Navid. Thanks a lot for this great talk. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, we announced the YouTube channel. So um, we do a few event announcements, and then we have two or three people that um, announce job offerings. Um, this one we announced last time already, so um, in a bit less than a month from now, there is Machine Learning Prague conference, which is two days of conference, and uh, before that, on the first day, is a workshop session. Um, and last time when we announced that, we also announced that we are going to give away one free ticket for the conference. Um, that was done by our email uh, newsletter, so you had the chance to submit just your name and email address, and we selected one winner, and the winner is um, Clifford Bednar. I don't know if he's here tonight. Are you here? He just left? Okay. So he's, he wants to go to, the conf to that conference already. Yeah, so congratulations to Clifford. Um, maybe we see him in the break. So for if you still want to go, um, we have a 10% off code there. It's VDLM, Vienna Deep Learning Meetup. 
And there is a good reason to go because me and uh, Alex, our other co-hosts who couldn't make it today, we are holding a workshop on the first day of Machine Learning Prague about deep learning for music classification using Keras. So we are kind of building a Keras introduction into the music classification task on the first day of Machine Learning Prague. If you still, if you still want to join, uh, March 23rd, and then the next two days is the conference. Um, another uh, interesting event is this Data Science Summer School, which happens end of June in Paris, I call Polytechnique, um, which is particularly interesting because there's also um, a tutorial on deep learning by Jan Lecun himself face from Facebook, one of the top gurus in deep learning, so maybe this is interesting to you. And then yet another um, summer school, Transylvanian Machine Learning Summer School, uh, 16th to 22nd of July in Romania. Uh, this one is also quite interesting because it uh, receives quite some contribution uh, from yeah, famous organizations like Google DeepMind, uh, Intel, Facebook, and so on. So it's partially also co-organized by people from these uh, institutions, as you can see with the lecturers and lab session people here. Um, for this one, we will send out more information tomorrow uh, in, an, in a newsletter on, to our members. Um, so you can, there's, I think, some application deadlines some soon if you still want to participate uh, in the lab. Um, yeah, 30th of March. And then um, I'll ask um, Jumio, uh, Radu, up here to tell us what they offer Jumio um, to the interesting deep learning community here. Oh, okay, thank you. Thanks, Tom, for uh, introducing. So, my name is uh, Radu Rogojano. I'm working at uh, Jumio as a computer uh, vision lead engineer. And um, yeah, thanks for having the opportunity to explain um, some things what we do. Oh. Okay, so what does uh, Jumio do? Um, we're doing trusted identity as a service. And you may uh, wonder what is that? Well, more and more uh, businesses ask themselves um, more about what their customers um, do and who they are. So do they really know um, who Mr. Um, Ford um, won? 1,995 at gmail.com is, right? So um, if, you, if you want to rent a car online, if you want to open um, a bank account online, obviously just sending um, an email address is not enough. So um, yeah, <laughs> Gmail verifies uh, your online customer um, by looking at um, images, by looking at images of, of um, IDs. Um, of course, we extract the data, we extract, um, we look at the selfies, we, we match the faces, and uh, we verify for our customers if um, Mr. Ford it really is Mr. Ford Mustang. <laughs> Obviously, I will not rent my room over Airbnb to this guy. Um, how do we do it? Um, that's a big effort. Um, we have a nice um, pair of infrastructure, data, verification experts, and machine learning team. Um, we have a um, large data set, about 110 million IDs already, a daily volume of about 250,000 a day, doubling every 8, 10 months. Of course, some of them are uh, also fraudsters. Uh, and this is what we do. We, we um, verify if, if the IDs are fine and everything is um, according to what they say. Um, we have a large verification um, expert team, 2,500. Some of them do special tagging for computer vision um, projects. Um, we have a very elastic um, scheduling. Um, just last weekend, we, we kick-started a project um, where we needed more taggers, so uh, we got 150 of them tagging um, special images for this special project. And yeah, now we are hiring. Um, we are um, aiming to um, uh, get um, the team larger by additional 10 positions. Um, some of them will be more towards um, research. 
Some of them will be more towards um, applied research. Obviously, it's not a clear separation between you know what is pure research and what is applied research. You always need some on ha hands-on experience. You always need some um, you know to play with the real data, which we have uh, to play with the new tagging um, projects, which we have. Um, but we need um, more people, so this is um, yeah. You're welcome to um, visit our website gmail.com slash careers. Um, I'll be here in the break and um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Radu. And then can I have Florian here up to present what they're doing and offering at Emotion 3D? Welcome, Florian. Thanks. Thanks, Tom, for the introduction. <clears throat> Good evening, also from my side. Um, my name is Florian Seitner from Emotion 3D. We are a Vienna-based company specialized on uh, image processing and video processing um, with a special focus on uh, 3D environment perception applications. What is it all about? Um, it's all about 3D scenes and capturing them with all types of sensors, cameras, uh, depth sensors, and so on and to extracting specific uh, high-level information about the scene. Uh, that's not our slide. <laughs> that's us. So we are strongly uh, working in the automotive and robotics area, and that's also where all the projects we are working on are uh, uh, located in. We have one strong focus on in-cabin analysis applications. Here it's about uh, driver monitoring, driver analysis. Uh, you want to know, for example, if a driver is falling asleep, if he uh, is distracted, for example, if he's looking left and is uh, turning right, uh, safety functionalities, and so on. And then the other area is everything that's happening around the car. Uh, so here it's about collision detection, collision avoidance, um, traffic sign recognition, intelligent lightning systems with using uh, like object recognition for directing the light of the car in specific directions and so on. So these are uh, typical applications we are working on and at the moment we, are, we have various open positions. Um, they're all machine learning uh, related, all using either deep learning approaches or classical uh, machine learning approaches and all with a strong computer vision um, relation. Yeah, uh, what is the expertise that we typically are building up? Um, we are working heavily in machine learning and computer vision, and the third area where we are uh, actively involved in is simulation. So here it's all about uh, creating training data for machine learning applications, for example, building virtual um, car environments where you can put virtual sensors in there and then generate a lot of data for training, for example, deep learning uh, networks. Yeah. Uh, if you're interested in a position um, or uh, just talking about what we are doing, um, I'm here f at the break and yeah, it would be great uh, if somebody is uh, interested in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Florian. So, yeah, we're going into a 30 minute break uh, where you have the excellent opportunity to talk to our speakers and to the people offering these exciting opportunities while having some drinks and snacks. Um, to the people that are watching on YouTube stream, this might be an excellent opportunity to check out the other talk from October uh, on Google TensorFlow when we had a Google speaker, um, Yufeng Guo from New York. This is in our playlist section of our brand new channel. It's quite empty yet, but this is a good talk, so recommend it to that. Um, uh, and we will be back in 30 minutes with our second speaker, Christoph, Christoph Bonnet. So enjoy the break and see you back in a while.
All right. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you, or we hope you enjoyed the break. Thanks again to uh, Eins for providing snacks and drinks. And now on the agenda, we have a uh, talk by yeah, Christoph Bonitz, who took the uh, uh, deep learning specialization course on Coursera by Andrew Ng, and is going to tell us a bit about how it looks like and what he took away from it. Yes. Thank you. All right. Let's pick my presentation. Uh, the clicker is here. Great. Good evening. My name is Christoph Bonitz. I work for a company called uh, Atomic, recently acquired by CA Technologies. I'm a software engineer, and my talk is a review of Andrew Ng's deep learning. Pardon? Of, is a review of, oh, okay, I'm not in presentation mode, thanks a lot. Um, of Andrew Ng's deep learning specialization on Coursera. Um, so, uh, I'll start with my motivation for giving this talk, give a little bit of overview about the structure of the specialization, and introduce the instructor. Uh, then, uh, in the main part of the, of the talk, I will talk about the curriculum of the course and especially what I personally like best about it. I will reflect on what you can and cannot expect to learn from this kind of course and then finish with some closing thoughts. Uh, I would like to thank my employer for supporting my <laughs> continuing edu education, but also like to note that, of course, those are my opinions and not necessarily those of my employer. And my employer and I are not affiliated with Coursera. All right. Uh, so uh, this wonderful meetup has been growing rather steadily. Uh, uh, there is a large amount of repeat visitors here, which is a testament to the great work done by the organizers. Uh, and it, this also makes it possible to have talks that are quite deep. Um, and they also require at least some basic knowledge of the subject area. But Every time we also have a significant number of new visitors. So a question that is quite natural to ask is, how can I learn the basics? So when I came to, my, to the first deep learning meetup that I attended one and a half years ago, I had a hard time finding a single comprehensive source for getting started with deep learning. It was rather fragmented. This has changed a lot since then. Uh, luckily, we have several good textbooks, some university has universities have put courses online, and there are dedicated online courses, both commercial and free, like the one I'm talking about today. Uh, and since learning is very subjective and everybody learns differently, I think a subjective experience can help, uh, can help make a good choice how to learn. It certainly helped me, so I was really eyeing the self-driving car engineer nano degree on Udacity last year. This was really cool. The advertisements were great. And Alek Lazarov did a talk at, at the meetup. And it was a great talk. I think it's a great course, but I realized it was not for me. So maybe I can help somebody make a good choice about how to get started with deep learning. And I think there are also some parts of the course that I took that could be interesting, interesting for more experienced practitioners. And I would like to point to those as well. So the structure of this specialization uh, is the first thing I'm going to talk about. Uh, for those who don't know Coursera, Coursera is a commercial platform for online courses. And the term specialization in, in, in their terminology is a series of courses around a certain topic. This particular one uh, consists of five courses of two to four weeks each. Uh, the format is video lectures with slides uh, and uh, the instructor rather copious, copious, copiously writes and draws on the slides, which makes it quite lively. Also, every week there are programming assignments uh, with Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, the libraries used a NumPy for implementing basic building blocks to learn about and understand those basic building blocks, and then moving on to higher level concepts, the Keras library is used. There's also a multiple choice quiz every week, uh, and uh, as, as I mentioned, this is a commercial course. Uh, the business model is freemium, so you can watch the videos for free. But if you want to do the exercises or a certificate, you have to pay for a subscription fee, which is around 40 euros a month. Um, my experience is that, it need, I, that I invested about four to 10 hours per week while I was doing the course. 
So why is this course interesting? The answer is basically the instructor. Uh, if you don't know Andrew Ng, I'll give a short introduction uh, with some highlights from his career. So he started out humbly as a Stanford professor. He's been teaching machine learning at least since 2008 and has been uh, a leading researcher in that area uh, for a long, long time. Uh, he did a on an online course about machine learning in 2012. Uh, I took it back then, and this course was really popular and started the whole MOOC craze that we have nowadays. And in passing, he founded Coursera together with Daphne Koller. So, uh, and around the time, he also co-founded and led the Google Brain project. Uh, and he then moved on to Baidu. For those who don't know Baidu, uh, the simplest way to say it is the Chinese Google, basically. And he led a research department of 1,500 engineers there. Uh, he left Baidu in March last year, and a little bit of trivia. So when he left the company, the stock uh, price fell by 1.5, uh, 2, 3%. This was a market capitalization loss of 1.5 billion for a brief time. Um, so this is a course of a top researcher in the machine learning field, not just a researcher, but somebody with a very broad industry experience, and it was created right after his last industry gig. And I've added some images from different parts of his career, and yes, that helicopter is doing aerobatics and flying upside down autonomously. That was 2008. All right, so the first course is called Neural networks and deep learning, it's very introductory. It answers the question what deep learning is all about. Uh, it's an introduction to machine learning in the context of deep learning. Uh, it, it asks what is deep learning and why is it taking off now? And the answer is basically this slide. So deep, uh, deep neural networks scale exceptionally well with the humongous amount of data that we nowadays have and we also have the compute capacity to make use of it. So uh, this is the reason why it's taking off. And uh, it also covers the basics of neural networks, so uh, simple feed-forward neural networks, as well as gradient descent. What I liked best about this course was more on the meta level. See, on the left-hand side, we see Andrew in, I think, 2008, teaching uh, linear regression, so uh, a supervised learning method. Uh, with an example of predicting house prices based on their size. Um, and he's using the same example in 2018 for neural networks. Uh, however, he's starting right away with neural networks, the simplest neural network possible, a single layer, single neuron neural network. Uh, however, if you're a little bit familiar, uh, you will notice that he's using a ReLU. So he's using modern techniques for the simplest motivational example. And I found this really nice that he's tailored this to, the con to, to what he wants to teach, and he's doing this really well across the course in general. So the second course is called Improving <laughs> Neural Networks, Hyperparameter Tuning, Regularization, and Optimization. It's a smorgasbord of topics uh, li like uh, bias variance, different optimization algorithms, normalization, regularization, the, the hyperparameter tuning process, and also uh, using deep learning frameworks. So really a lot covered in this course. Um, what I liked a lot about this course were two insights about hyperparameter tuning that were not, not that obvious to me. So the first one is that Andrew really recommends not using grid search, but rather random search. His reasoning for that is that Hyperparameters tend to be independent of each other, so if you do a random search, you will cover much more values of a single hyperparameter than you would do with a grid search, where you run several models with the same value for a particular hyperparameter. The other one was a metaphor that I really liked. It's pandas versus caviar. It's about how uh, pandas and fish reprodu reproduce. So pandas have one or two cubs at a time, which uh, uh, they tend to, and they make sure that they're doing well, uh, whereas fish lay lots of eggs and just hope for the best. And Andrew suggests that you should rather, if you have the computational budget for doing so, run many models and select the best one empirically rather than hand-tuning a single model, even though he admits that this is not always possible due to costs and computational budgets. But I really like this metaphor. It's quite memorable. So... The third course is called Structuring Machine Learning Projects. This is kind of where he distills his industry experience. Um, it talks about how to orthogonalize uh, the problem space. Uh, so this, uh, to, uh, it talks about how to set goals. 
uh, it's about comparing neural network performance to human level performance and uh, going beyond that in some cases, how to do that. One important topic is error analysis. And uh, uh, it, uh, one thing he also talks quite extensively about are mismatch distributions of training, dev, and te test sets, which is acceptable in s some cases. And it's also closely related to the next topic, which is data augmentation. Uh, and at the end, he also covers transfer and multitask learning. What I liked best was not technical, but rather a soft factors uh, insight. It, it's really much easier for a team to focus and improve on, on an engineering task if you give them a single real valued evaluation matrix to improve upon. Um, I've recently realized that this is not just true for machine learning, but also, for example, for performance optimization. And of course, the art is finding a metric that matches your business goals. But I think this is a really important and good insight, and uh, I found this very interesting. The fourth, fourth course is about con uh, convolutional neural networks. Most of the things one sees in the press are usually convolutional neural networks. Uh, so I've, I'm showing an, an image of the Google Net here. Uh, it's about basic convolutional uh, neural network theory. Uh, about object classification and classical networks for this task, like uh, LXNet, uh, VGG, uh, uh, Google, uh, uh, the uh, Inception architecture, and also ResNets. Um, then moves on to object localization and detection using the YOLO algorithm. So like many things in deep learning, YOLO is a pop culture reference. It's not you only live once, uh, but you only look once. It's a very fancy, but also very efficient algorithm for uh, detecting bounding bo uh, detecting several objects in an image and drawing bounding boxes or finding bounding boxes around it, them. Uh, Andrew then covers phase uh, recognition and verification, and the course concludes with neural style transfer, which is also something you've probably seen. What I liked best was really the part about the YOLO. YOLO is a rather complicated algorithm, uh, uh, and uh, Andrew himself admitted that he needed to talk to a few colleagues to fully understand and grasp the paper, but I think he did some uh, great work in making it accessible to, stu to a student. And one of the one of the exercises is implementing parts of the algorithm. So you look at the videos, but at the end of the week, you, uh, you, your algorithm uh, results in some bounding boxes around cars, which is rather nice. It's very satisfying, and it's, it's, it's I think it's cool that he chose something ambitious like a, a, a state-of-the-art algorithm, not something simplistic and boring. The last course is about sequence models. So uh, we've heard a little bit about word embeddings today, which is great. Um, and uh, generally, there are lots of, uh, lots of problems that can be solved when you look at your input as a sequence, like text to speech, uh, text classification. And in this course, uh, uh, the first thing that's taught is classical uh, recurrent neural networks. Uh, then uh, Andrew introduces the LSTM and GRU cells. Uh, the, it, he introduces the concept of attention, uh, talks about word embeddings uh, and generative models, and the course ends with some speech recognition. So I've, I'm showing here some, some types of recurrent neural networks and another image about word embeddings. What I personally like best were two applications of, se uh, of sequence models uh, that were used in the exercises. The first one used a model from natural language uh, translation, um, bidirectional LSTMs and attention to parse fuzzy human written dates into a standardized format. I found that really insightful because it applied a, com a concept that would otherwise need humongous amounts of data to something uh, that's easy to grasp. And the other top, uh, applied topic I really liked was trigger word detection. And this image, uh, this screenshot shows one of the Jupyter notebooks. Uh, the, the task was to do some data augmentation. And uh, they made it really easy to understand if you're doing things right or not. So they have the spectrogram that's expected and the spectrogram that, uh, that the student creates next to each other. And one 
more thing I found really good about this course, so uh, you mentioned word embeddings and that they learn the bias of the texts. And uh, Andrew addresses this topic. He talks about biases in word embeddings and how to de-bias word embeddings. And I think if uh, uh, the, the topic of ethics in AI is really important and uh, it starts small, like even teaching an introductory course, uh, looking at how is what we're learning affecting maybe some disadvantaged groups and what can we do about it. I think this is really great. So some more things that I enjoyed. Well, most of it, most of all, I enjoyed Andrew Ng's teaching style. He's really, really good at explaining concepts uh, and also making themes, uh, making topics and, and uh, algorithms not seem overwhelming. He's very encouraging. You see, he has a lot of teaching experience. He's just a very pleasant speaker. I found him personally very likable. Uh, one more thing I really liked was an extra of this course. There were a lot of interviews in the first two courses with leading deep learning researchers, people like uh, uh, Jeff Hinton, uh, Joshua Bengio, Andre Carpati, which I found super interesting. He asked them about what they, how they got started with deep learning and what advice they give to people entering the field. I also found the discussion forums very helpful. My only gripe with the course was uh, the, there are exercises that you do and there's the auto grader which grades your exercises and you can uh, think of unit tests that you can, you can see. So you are uh, building your program, trying to solve a problem and you grade it uh, with unit tests that you can't see and this is kind of annoying sometimes. Python is, uh, uh, is a dynamically typed language and sometimes the auto grader rejects something because it's the wrong data type. This kind of thing got better the longer a course was online, but I did the courses basically each of them when they came out, so this was kind of a hassle. But I think it's mostly solved now. So what do I think you can learn from this specialization? Uh, this is really a rather technical theoretical course. Uh, it will give you a good understanding of the terms, notation, fundamental algorithms, and of the most important and rather current models of deep learning. So. If you do the quizzes and programming assignments and aim for a good score, uh, which is possible, you can retry things, I think you really get a good understanding. And after that, you should be able to read research papers and you should also be able to understand the what's new in deep learning section that's following this talk. So I, I think it's really helpful in this context. The course will also give you some basic intuition about the current state the po and possibilities of deep learning, so which problems can you apply it to, and a general idea of how to set up a project to solve a business problem. And it contains Andrew's up-to-date insights from his industry experience, which I really liked. What you surely cannot learn from this course. So data preparation is truly not something you will learn. All the data is prepared for you, ready to use in a very convenient format. You build the basic building blocks or a simple or high level neural network based on data that's super accessible. If you want, want to learn data preparation, one thing I can really recommend is the Applied Data Science with Python specialization on Coursera, which I also did, which I I can't say I really enjoyed it, but it was super. It was kind of tedious sometimes, but super practically applicable. So I'm basically using this stuff every day in my job now. Uh, so I learned a lot. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 the uh, dirty part of the job, and you kind of learn it with this one. So this is really something I can recommend. You will not do end-to-end -end projects in this course. It's really uh, you do a, a very small part of the whole algorithm. There is a free online course called Deep Learning for Coders at Fast.ai, um, which focuses very much on a top-down top down teaching approach. You, so you do end-to-end -end projects, and the way you verify your learning is by participating in Kaggle competitions. I think this is a really cool approach. I personally need some foundations before I can dive into the practical parts of a topic. I can't tend to get stuck if I just start with some code and, and start from there. So for me, this course was nice, and now I'm kind of enjoying this other course, but I got stuck in this other course before that. And you will also not learn about applying deep learning to structured data, the kind of things you find in big companies, in databases. Andrew mentions this as a 
uh, kind of hidden successful uh, success story of deep learning that uh, many companies are applying deep learning very successfully to structured data, but then doesn't treat it in its course at all, which I found a little bit disappointing. There are also several videos and uh, exercises in this deep learning for coders course that cover exactly this topic. Uh, for example, embedding categorical data, which uses quite similar techniques uh, uh, to those you described here. And of course, it, you would, it will also not help you understand the math behind deep learning. Uh, you will have to read many textbooks or maybe get a math degree uh, to, to do that. But also can be enjoyable. So to conclude, I personally thoroughly enjoyed this specialization. Um, it fit my personal learning style, which is rather bottom up and start with the foundation really, really well. Um, I think it's good at teaching the basic concepts, so if you're trying to enter the field, are interested more in the theoretical side and enjoy a bottom-up style of learning, this course may be for you. If you're more practically oriented, oriented uh, you like a top-down approach, you want to start with some code, download something from GitHub and go from there, um, the deep learnings for coders on fast AI might be the right thing for you. If you are an experienced practitioner, I would still recommend skimming this sec uh, sorry, third course, the Structuring Machine Learning Projects, because uh, watching videos is free and uh, they are really insightful. I, I think they are helpful. And if you're interested in deep learning research, the interviews are also great, because it basically does the same structure of interview with several different researchers, and I found this super interesting. So this concludes my talk. I think we can take some questions as well. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot for the talk. So if you have any question to an experienced Coursera student. Yeah, thanks for your talk, very interesting. Um, I'm also looking at, uh, I'm, I'm in the middle of doing the same specialization and it's, I, I share many of the, the points that you raised. Um, I'm also looking at it not, not so much maybe because I want to learn stuff, but because I'm about to teach a uh, deep mm -hmm. learning class also and I wanted to look at how experienced people like this guy are doing it and how to you know, start and, and how to explain the, the fundamental concepts. Uh, I want to ask you about your feeling of the programming exercises because for my impression they were maybe very simple but I'm also I haven't finished the later courses so I felt most of the programming assignments so the the general examples that they're 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 uh, that you're supposed to do are interesting and the it it nicely fits the picture of the stuff that he presents in the course but I felt they really tell you what you, sh so there's like one line missing and they almost tell you the exact line you're supposed to type there right above. So it yes. seemed to me a bit like very, very simple. Yes. So I'd like to hear what, how you felt about this. So uh, if you're familiar with NumPy, for example, Keras, I think yes. Uh, as you mentioned, the blanks you have to fill in tend to be very small. I th still think that it's valuable. Uh, so. I've tried to learn this kind of stuff from several courses and also Hinton's course, which is a bit outdated. And I've found that actually doing this nitty gritty uh, kind of helps to not gloss over these concepts, right? You can easily read con about a concept and think you understand it, but then when you apply it and the, the dimensions of something just don't match up, uh, you understand that part of your understanding is wrong, or uh, how does propagation for a mini batch really work? And yes, you can just uh, fill in the blanks and not learn a lot, but I th I've still found it helpful. Like it corrects misunderstandings that I maybe had. And uh, I found that later in the course when I was more familiar with NumPy also from other work I was, I'm, I'm doing otherwise, uh, yes, it, I, I was rather fast doing this, but still I found it helpful as a learner. But yeah, I, I found, it, found it also quite interesting because you you're watching it to see how to teach it. Cool. Any more questions? Um, from your point of view, what are the requirements to start with the course? Uh, which kind of pre-education do you need? 
Thanks. Uh, good point. I, I didn't didn't put that uh, on my slides, and I forgot to talk about it. So, what you need is you have to be able to program a little bit at least. You have to be uh, comfortable with under uh, implementing basic algorithms. That's one thing. And one more thing you should be comfortable with is applied basic linear algebra and calculus. Uh, s I mean, calculus is probably optional, and you don't have to understand the linear algebra deeply. Uh, but a matrix vector multiplication or a matrix matrix multiplication should be something you're comfortable dealing with, right? The more comfortable you are with skipping over the math, probably the more the, the, the less the threshold is. Uh, but yeah, some basic math, some basic programming. Any more questions? I, I have a very short one. Yes. On the on the freemium part, you said there's yes. you, you pay around forty euros yes. a month, so that's a fixed sum per month. If you go slower, no. you pay more money. Or uh, yeah, right, right. So so the the weeks are basically a suggestion. So now it is now that all the courses are online, you can do them as fast or as slowly as you want and pay accordingly. So okay. yeah, you pay always the same. Yeah. yeah. Total amount. Yes. Uh, however, uh, so there's like their yeah, typical startup. Uh, they are doing A/B testing on the pricing, literally. Uh, like I was offered a few months ago uh, an all Coursera subscription. That's uh, in as part of an A/B testing thing. So I, th I'm not sure if you now. So different. I think you either pay for one course or uh, for all of them. It really depends which A/B bucket you're in right now. <laughs> yeah, okay. that's Silicon Valley. <laughs> You have to register twice, and yes, <laughs> okay, and and then yeah. Jumio or Jumio will tell you, uh, <laughs> uh, will tell them that you're the same that person. The same. All the time. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. And coming to the last part, so I think Tom is up now. It's, does this still work? No. Do we have to restart it? Okay. Um, yeah, this is the last part of the meetup before we go to another networking session. Um, this part is called Hot Topics and Latest News, or reversed. Um, so we, that was I think the fourth meetup that we did, this is already the 16th, uh, when we had the idea there's so much changing, so much going on in deep learning, we should really keep track of what's going on each month and present it in a very compact form every month to you. But of course we can't observe everything, so it's, we also want to ask you, so if you come across something really exciting that is new and fresh and maybe other people don't know about it yet and should know about it, uh, please mail it to us, write it to us, um, or just come up with some slides yourself. We appreciate that this is an, a community where everyone contributes, so it's about knowledge exchange, uh, bringing other people forward by something you discovered, you know, and so on. So this is a call to all the people here and also watching us. Um, please help contribute because this we want to the main aim here is to build a community where everyone uh, benefits. Um, before we start with this hot topic session, we forgot to do that in the beginning, uh, we'd like to ask um, who here in the audience is here for the first time, I mean at the meetup. <coughs> okay, uh, let's do the counter example. Who has been at the meetup before? It's about half half, I would say, yeah, good. Um, who is new to deep learning? Okay, about a third, a bit less maybe. Um, who would say he has a lot of knowledge in deep learning already? He or she? Yeah, maybe 10, 15 people. Yeah, good, good, good. So we want to raise this number like we want all of you to become experts. 
I mean, of course, we are, we're not ourselves. OK, um, let's move on. So um, yeah, usually, the if, if you don't send us stuff, we try to collect stuff, which is not always easy. I myself will focus more on this like stuff that is popular in the popular news or that is more high level, while Jan has a very, very much a focus on latest research output, which is an immense uh, lot of new stuff coming up. And he reads almost all of these papers. Well, he will point you to other stuff so you can, can read those papers y yourself and, and help us increase this section. But OK, we want to keep it short. So um, the news, you've probably heard it. Um, we announced a couple of months back that Google is working on something that's called the TPU, the Tensor Processing Unit, as opposed to, like, uh, if you, if you don't, in case you don't know, uh, right now most of deep learning, at least the training part, is done on GPUs, on graphics cards, and there is, um, yeah, a rather big company, uh, the number one in providing those graphics cards. Maybe I shouldn't name it today. We have named it a couple of times, uh, but you know. Um, so um, there is, of course, other companies that strive to um, to provide hardware themselves. Recently, I heard Intel is also working on on some um, uh, either making um, their CPUs uh, deep learning capable, they're working on a mobile um, deep learning chip, and they're also working on some GPUs. But uh, the hot news here is uh, Google now opens access to the TPUs, which doesn't mean you can buy them or order them. It means rather you can use them through the Google Cloud. And here we also have the price that was released. Uh, as a comparison, I think on an Amazon uh, GPU machine, you pay about half of the price. But then we come on the next slide to the comparison in terms of speed. So yeah, you get the point. So one uh, tensor processing um, unit contains 64 gigabytes of uh, graphic of, of RAM. Actually, the V here is not correct. It's uh, memory. Uh, and 180 teraflops peak performance. That means uh, the processing speed. Um, in the article, we, we usually put the links here so you can check out more details yourself. Um, it mentions it's available in limited quantities, whatever that means. Um, but uh, if you want to use it, you basically have to have access to Google Cloud and you have to request a TPU quota and describe what you want to do with it. And then they, they give you access to it. Uh, I didn't try my... Has anyone uh, tried to access TPUs on, on Google Cloud? No one. There is. There was a, for a while already the TPU alpha tester and beta testing program where some people could subscribe, but I met only I think one person who was subscribed to it so far. Um, okay, some independent company made a TPU benchmark, uh, which in the figure here is quite um, speaking quite some words, but you have to take it a little bit with care. So what they did is they took three popular or four, actually, f four popular um, architectures of deep neural networks, the ResNet 50, the Inception V3, um, and uh, an LSTM model. So the other two, actually, um, ResNet and Inception, again, on 16-bit 16, 16 uh, floating point. So they compared these models because Google announced that especially um, ResNet, Inception, and such networks would benefit from the tensor processing unit. So they, they compared these um, to um, NVIDIA uh, P100 and NVIDIA V100 uh, instances. Um, and the graphic shows the number of pictures that can be processed per second. That was, of course, an, uh, an image retrieval, image analysis task. Um, so they measured in the throughput in number of pictures per second. And um, what they determined here is that using the TPU, the version 2 that came out now, it, um, it is 84 times faster than the NVIDIA P100 and still 5.1 times faster than the NVIDIA V100. Um, but uh, when I read the article, I, I, I already um, saw that, that they use different batch sizes, which if you are one of the deep learning experts here, you would know that this has an impact on the processing speed. So people commented under the article and they repeated the experiment using uniquely 128 batch size for both experiments. 
and then the difference uh, where is the the difference is then uh, 5.6 times and 3.4 times faster with these two graphic cards. So it's still a lot, but not as much as before already. So that's the impact of the batch size on the on the speed. Um, then they also did that on the Inception V3 with similar results. And then um, in other news, it was mentioned that um, long short-term memory networks wouldn't benefit as much, but they made the test with a s very small network because, I mean, the, the big companies with a lot of resourcing power now go for very big neural networks like ResNet50 and things like that. But as a, let's say, as a startup or a researcher, you're not always able to wait a month on a super cluster for your results. So you would sometimes use smaller models, and they did this test too. And surprisingly, it was still it was 12.9 times faster than on the on the graphics cards, uh, which is even more than on the on the big models. That was kind of unexpected, and that was one of their findings. The details are described in this uh, link here. And by the way, we'll provide all the slides uh, tomorrow underneath the, the meetup uh, schedule as a comment. Um, <coughs> So on other news, Amazon, another one of the big companies, is uh, also working on creating an AI chip, but not many details are yet revealed by that. It's just that uh, people say it's gonna they're gonna go for the mobile. I mean the the, the smart home devices like uh, the Echo, uh, rather than providing. Um, providing them in the cloud services they have, um, as Google does right now. Um, it's also said that, um, yeah, the I mean, the, um, providing these new kind of chips in the cloud services they're offering is kind of a, a diversification factor for these cloud companies. So it's, yeah, it seems a bit starting a little bit of war here. Um, as you see, also Intel, uh, NVIDIA and uh, Google, Apple, like all these companies are working on something AI hardware related, but uh, trying to be a bit different. Um, going to software, we've heard a little bit today about deep learning frameworks. Today actually not so much, but in, in some other meetups, and you can find still the resources online. We have covered a few of these um, deep learning frameworks. They're like more low level ones, TensorFlow, you probably have heard in recent news, uh, the higher level version or, or the higher level API to it is Keras, which makes it more quite convenient to, to get started uh, with deep learning. Both of them are today under the hood of uh, Google. And that's something that, is, that you see in this circle. It's more and more going towards the big companies because back even one year back, you had open source. I mean, there are, I think all of them are open source. But back then, uh, even a year ago, you had um, libraries like Theano or Cafe or Torch, which were community-based um, and uh, mostly merged out of universities, so academic area. And now um, the big companies have taken over deep learning. So the Facebook, for example, created Cafe 2, which with quite some advantages over Cafe. Um, PyTorch became more popular than the original Torch. Uh, and Tiano uh, some months ago announced that they're going to stop development at version 1.0. It's kind of giving the, the floor to, to TensorFlow, the combination TensorFlow Keras on the Google side. And then uh, Amazon has taken over kind of development of MXNet, another popular framework. Uh, Microsoft released Microsoft CNTK, the Cognitive Toolkit, as it was formerly called. We had a session on that one two some months back um, and then um, a recent initiative is a, a joint initiative of Amazon and Microsoft working on something called Gluon which we haven't heard so much uh, yet about. Um, that leads to the question also so first of all what should you use as a beginner? Um, I don't tell my recommendation now in this context but maybe in another time. Um, 
but also it leads to the question when you build successfully your model and then you want to roll it out, so you built it maybe on a, a super nice uh, server, GPU server or even cluster or cloud service, but then you want to deploy it on mobile, so you might have to use a different framework, so you trained on TensorFlow, but then you want to ro roll it out on, I don't know, Microsoft device. Um, mobile device or something. So you need to change and switch across the frameworks, which is a little bit cumbersome these days, because yes, neural networks is mostly about uh, weights to be stored in the in the neurons, but um, to figure out what's the format, how to save them, how to load them back and initialize the, the same kind of neural network architecture on another framework can be really um, cumbersome. So um, some other clever people uh, introduced the Open Neural Network Exchange, ONNX, um, which is supposed to, be can to become kind of a standard to exchange across all these um, toolkits and, and platforms. Uh, but it's in the early days. Uh, they have a few of the libraries of the tools on board, Cafe2, PyTorch, Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit, Toolkit the Apache MXNet, um, they are all already on board. Google is not on board, so let's see where this goes and, and how popular it becomes. But it would help a lot the deep learning community. Um, this is um, some scientific output of uh, neuroscience laboratory in Kyoto. No, sorry, a neuroscience laboratory in Japan, and and well, both of them are in Japan. Kyoto, Kyoto University in Japan. Um, so I'm switching now to the more scientific topics, which uh, Jan will will complete. Um, that is an AI algorithm that is reading your mind. Is the is the announcement? The statement sounds quite, um, yeah, kind of crazy. But um, they have a solid research paper, which is interesting to read. At least you can skim the, it on the news article that is linked uh, there. Um, so the concept is that, well, it would generate images from what you are thinking of, so from your brain activity, but uh, I guess it's still too uh, good to be true. Um, so what they're actually doing is they measure fMRI, so that's uh, um, uh, uh, brain scanning, brain activity, um, which where they create a picture from, which is kind of showing this activity, which is kind of this, this graph here, and then they, they map it um, to the picture that the person sees. So the person is shown an image like this, uh, is it a lion? This lion here. And um, you and they measure the activity and then they correlate uh, this activity through the neural network with the original image and they try to reconstruct the image based on the brain activity that is shown on, on what they measure from the brain. So this is kind of, um, some people might have seen this Google Deep Dream, dream where they uh, train a network first and then reconstruct images and then something like this, uh, like dreamed up images come up. In this case, it's just not in your network, the dreams, but it's um, uh, it's correlated to the to the to the ac brain activity from the person seeing the image. So that's the reconstructed image then, which well, it's not exactly a lion, but it resembles somehow it. Yeah, this is the point where I hand over to Jan, that has more exciting, who has more exciting news to present. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I will try to go fast. <coughs> so this is uh, a paper from from December, so it's already quite old. It's uh, called Objects That Sound, and uh, in that paper they trained a neural network on well, such that you can feed it a video, like a YouTube video of somebody playing some music, and it will draw into the video what what object uh, creates the the sound that's currently uh, that you can currently hear. So, for I don't know, for this flute example, it will highlight the flute, and when somebody's singing, it will highlight the mouth, and that's quite fun. Now, how do they how do they do this? So they didn't sit down and and download YouTube videos and and annotate them and draw for each frame where the sound came from. They they just downloaded a bunch of YouTube video of people doing music, and then they started with a network that looks like this, 
So it has two parts. This is the uh, is a video frame, and this is a spectrogram of the sound that's surrounding this frame. So I actually don't know how. Oh, it's one second. Okay, so it's one second around the frame. They process the video frame into with a convolutional network into some some vector, and the same for the spectrogram. So they get two vectors, and then they train something else on top that tells whether uh, this sound is corresponding to the video frame. So they feed it with a lot of uh, frames and spectrograms from YouTube videos. Sometimes they match, and sometimes the spectrogram is taken from another video or from another position altogether. <coughs> so what you get by this is uh, similar to the word to back we had before. It learns an embedding space, a joint embedding space uh, for images and spectrograms where um, the vectors for, for corresponding videos, video frames and spectrograms are close together and the ones that are uh, not corresponding are far apart. Now this doesn't uh, already allow you to, to pinpoint where the sound came from in this video frame. What they did then was to slightly change the network architecture. So now this, uh, the video processing network does not output uh, an embedding, it already outputs a map of correspondences. Um, so for, for different positions in the image, it tells whether this, wh whatever is visible there, matches the sound. Um, and then they, they give back the, the maximum activation in this correspondence map. So in the beginning, this correspondence map will look totally random. And then similar again, similar to the word to vec thing, it will start moving whatever happened to be the maximum activation here closer to the spectrogram or further apart if it's a mismatch. And in the beginning, it will not move the correct parts, but just because, I don't know, like computer monitors can occur in all kinds of videos, they get moved back and forth, and the only things that get moved uh, consistently are the ones that correspond to the sounds. So in the end, after training it, you will get a correspondence map that highlights the correct locations in the video. So this, that's an instance uh, of multi-instance learning where you, you know the label for the full image and you want to infer the labels for parts of the image. And it works surprisingly well. Then uh, another thing from the audio domain you may be familiar with uh, adversarial examples. Uh, that's something that, that most classifiers are sus susceptible to, including uh, deep neural networks, but also simpler classifiers. It's uh, when you train the classifier, you can usually find slight modifications of images that uh, cause the, the classifier to, to cross some, some of the classification boundaries, so it will uh, output another class than a human would, would uh, uh, give to this image. So here we have a panda, and we add some, something that looks like noise, but is carefully crafted uh, by, by knowledge of the, the classifier to be uh, something that only minimally modifies the image but causes the classifier to output a different label with high confidence. And in this paper, they, they showed that the same is also possible for speech recordings. So here, I don't know if I can actually play the sound. Let's see what happens if I click here. Ich möchte es öffnen.
Okay, I guess we don't have sound, do we? Well, then I can fake it. So when I click here, it says, without the data set, the article is useless. <laughs> and when I click here, it says, without the data set, the article is useless. There's some slight noise in the background. You, you hear it when you, when you hear closely. Uh, it's, it's similar to this noise. It's very minimal. It's almost imperceptible. Nobody will, will yeah, hear something else than, than the original sentence. But most speech recognizers will hear, OK, Google, browse to evil.com. <laughs> and you can imagine that you can use this for, yeah, for OK, Google, or for the, the Amazon Echo, or for other things to, to embed some hidden com voice commands in, in something that looks completely insuspicious. Then this is something that's also old. It's already from NIPS 2017, which was also in uh, last year, in the end of last year. But uh, I just recently found this. It's called Born Again Neural Networks. And it's a, it's a technique that tends to improve a classifier without much extra work. So you first you start uh, a classifier neural network on some data set as usual. So you feed it with pairs of images and labels. And uh, in this case, so this is uh, the classification error on the CIFAR 100 data set that they used for the paper. You get some, some result. Then in the second step, you pass all the training data through the model and record the output. And you don't only record which class it gave to the image, you record the probabilities it assigned to all the possible classes. So you get a bunch of probability vectors here. And then you train a new model. It it's, uh, can be the same architecture, but again, starting from a new random initialization. And you train it simultaneously to minimize the uh, prediction error of the label and the prediction error of the pseudo label that you got here. And uh, by, by magic, it improves the error. So their hand-waving argument is that this guides the network uh, into some better local minimum than it would have discovered without this guidance from the, yeah, from, from trying to predict the probabilities of the non-target classes. And then again, you can, you can even uh, repeat this and use this model, produce new pseudo labels, and train a new model. And sometimes it happens that the error consistently decreases until at some point it doesn't work anymore. And in the very end, you can do uh, what's called a born again neural network ensemble. You take all the models you, you had so far and you average their predictions and you get an even lower error. And I actually tried this yesterday on the problem I, I just, I'm just working on and it works. That's cool. <laughs> okay, and uh, that's it for today. Um, yeah, if you want to find other papers that I missed, and I missed a lot, uh, you can either check a archive sanity or deeplearn.org. Those are some aggregators that try to give you a little bit better overview or filtered overview of, of what's currently being published on archive and tweet it about on Twitter. All right. So yeah, this concludes our already 16th deep learning meetup. I hope there was some valuable stuff included here. Uh, let's thank both of our speakers again. Uh, Navid Rekapsatz, Theo Wien, who is moving to EPFL very soon, like in two days, and Christoph Bornitz from Atomic. Let's thank the speakers. <laughs> Thank you also to our host, uh, Eins, who uh, provided the
the setup, this wonderful venue, uh, the catering, and special thanks to Susanne Dorman who or helped us organize um, this meetup tonight uh, in the weeks before leading to this um, date to date. Um, yeah, special thanks also to Alex Schindler, who is not with us here, but is our third host. And who did I forget? No. Um, usually we announce the date of the next meetup, but we don't have it yet. It might happen on 27th of March, so ex exactly in a month from now. It might also happen that we move on to April and don't have one in March. Um, yeah, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, but I guess exciting topics coming up. As always, you see, we cover quite a broad range of topics and help you also with the, with the hot topics and latest news. So, yeah, enjoy. I hope you enjoy it. And, uh, yeah, try these examples yourself if you lower the error as, as Jan did and solve your problem. Okay. Um, have enjoyed the networking and discussions, and see you next time. Have a good night. <laughs>